It's time for the three question warrant for Biochem 8. What part of the basal ganglia, if lesion, causes hemibolismus? So this is the subthalamic nucleus, which can be lesioned in a lacunar stroke, and then you'll have too much movement, which will present as that a hemibolismus. Next, what is the difference between open angle glaucoma and acute angle closure glaucoma? So an open angle glaucoma, this is pretty common, it's the insidious form, almost always bilateral. Risk factors include older than uh, age 40, uh, black, diabetes, uh, early stage, asymptomatic. Late stage, you can see kind of areas of reduced absent vision, uh, also mostly on the periphery, and then it goes to the central vision. For the acute angle closure glaucoma, this is an emergency. Abrupt onset of pain, you get nausea, colored halos, rainbows around light. You get this red, teary eye uh, with hazy cornea, a fixed mid-dilated pupil, meaning it's not very reactive to light, and uh, it's very firm to palpation. Next, what are the retroperitoneal abdominal structures? So we used a couple of mnemonics uh, for this one, like sad pucker or a duck pair. We, we favor the a duck pair. Uh, for the A, it's for adrenal glands. D is for a duodenum, a second, third, and fourth parts of your duodenum, but not the first part of your duodenum. A U is for ureters. C is for the colon, and this is the descending and ascending colon, but not the transverse colon. K is for kidneys. So that's the duck. And then for pear, we have P is for the pancreas, everything except the tail of the pancreas. E is for esophagus, at least the part of, of the uh, south of the diaphragm. And then obviously the upper esophagus is in that mediastinum. Uh, a is for aorta and R is for rectum. All right, that's it for the warm-up. Let's get that lecture now. In the last video, we talked about glycolysis, and I hinted at how that leads into the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain. We're going to get to that soon enough. Hold your horses. But first, while we're thinking about glucose, I want to finish talking about the different things you can do with glucose. For instance, you can synthesize new glucose in the liver and export it to the rest of the body when the blood glucose gets low. And that process is called gluconeogenesis. So number four in the study guide is basically an expanded version of the glycolytic pathway from the glycolysis video. Glycolysis is the process of converting glucose to pyruvate and ultimately lactate. Gluconeogenesis is basically the same thing, but in reverse. So instead of going down the pathway, now we're going up from pyruvate toward glucose. The reason that the gluconeogenesis pathway is a little different is that you have to overcome the three steps of glycolysis that are irreversible. So you can't use those same enzymes. Steps that are reversible steps can share enzymes for gluconeogenesis, but the irreversible steps need different enzymes to go the other way. So down at the bottom, the conversion of phosphoenyl pyruvate to pyruvate is irreversible. So to work around that, you use the enzyme O, which is pyruvate carboxylase. And pyruvate carboxylase requires the coenzyme biotin, which is letter P. So carboxylation, or adding CO2 to something, requires biotin. So pyruvate carboxylase requires biotin. That's going to create letter Q, which is oxaloacetate. Letter R is acetyl-CoA, which is stimulating this process. So remember, acetyl-CoA is what your body's feeding into the TCA cycle. So if there's an abundance of acetyl-CoA around, that signals that you have plenty of energy around, and you need to go back up this pathway. Then next, to get from oxaloacetate to PEP, you use enzyme S which is PEP carboxykinase. So PEP carboxykinase takes oxaloacetate and makes PEP. Then you use the reversible enzymes to go back up the pathway on the right until you come to phosphofructokinase 1, which again is irreversible. So you have to use a different enzyme to get past that step, which is letter T, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. And that's the rate limiter of gluconeogenesis, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. And make note, if you're looking at the 2014 of step up to step one, this was misprinted. It should be fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, not 2,6-bisphosphatase. Now fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase is stimulated by ATP, which is letter U. So again, if you've got a lot of energy around, you can undergo gluconeogenesis. You don't need to be selfish with the glucose. You need to be sharing more glucose. Then letters V and W are things that inhibit this enzyme. So letter V is AMP, and letter W is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Again, it makes sense. These are molecules of energy deficiency. So if you're energy deficient, you don't need to be sharing glucose. And if you peek over at the glycolysis pathway on the other side, you'll see that when you reverse the ratios so that you have low ATP and high AMP and high fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, that's going to stimulate PFK1 and drive the pathway in the other direction toward glycolysis. Then letter X is the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase, which converts glucose 6-phosphate into glucose. So there are four unique enzymes in the gluconeogenesis pathway. Pyruvate carboxylase, PEP carboxykinase, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, which is the rate limiter, and glucose 6-phosphatase. So make sure you know those enzymes.
Now, where is gluconeogenesis actually taking place? Well, it's a very specialized process with these very specialized enzymes. So only cells that are designed to share glucose are going to have these enzymes. For instance, the reason that muscle cells can't perform gluconeogenesis and make their own glucose is that the muscles don't have glucose 6-phosphatase. So gluconeogenesis occurs mainly in the hepatocytes. And these specialized enzymes can also be found in the kidney and in the intestinal epithelium. And when does gluconeogenesis take place? Well, it takes place whenever blood glucose is low. So when your blood glucose is low and your cells need glucose, hepatocytes start doing two things. Number one, they're going to start sharing their glycogen stores, which we're going to go over in the next video. And number two, the hepatocytes will start converting other molecules into pyruvate and using that pyruvate to make glucose. And that's gluconeogenesis, the making of new glucose. So if you're unable to create new glucose from other substrates, the blood sugar is going to remain low and you're going to get hypoglycemia in the fasting state. So what specifically can enter this process of gluconeogenesis? Again, it's anything that can be converted to pyruvate. So you have uh, odd-chain fatty acids that generate propionyl-CoA, and that propionyl-CoA can ultimately be converted to pyruvate, which can then be used for gluconeogenesis. A lot of your TCA cycle molecules can be converted to pyruvate and used in gluconeogenesis. Uh, some of these molecules can be converted to oxaloacetate, which can then enter this gluconeogenesis pathway. Also, some amino acids can be converted to TCA cycle substrates or to oxaloacetate or to pyruvate, which can then be used for gluconeogenesis. Now, have you ever stopped to think about why our bodies go to such great lengths to make sure glucose is available? I mean, if there are all these other things that could be made into pyruvate and acetyl-CoA and run through the TCA cycle, why bother with gluconeogenesis at all? What's so great about glucose? What's wrong with using fats and proteins and other stuff for energy? Well, it has to do with the amount of energy that different energy molecules can release. And that brings us to the very testable topic of Gibbs free energy. Now, this actually does show up on step one. So look at question number five in your study guide. What is the formula for Gibbs free energy? The equation for Gibbs free energy is delta G equals delta H minus T times delta S. So the change in G equals the change in H minus T times the change in S. So G is Gibbs free energy. H is enthalpy, or the heat change in a constant pressure reaction. T is temperature. And S is entropy, which is disorder and randomness. Now remember, we said we have to couple energy-consuming endergonic reactions to energy-releasing exergonic reactions. And some compounds have more energy-releasing potential than others. So if you compared a molecule of glucose to a molecule of ATP, which of those has more exergonic potential? Well, glucose, of course, because you can generate around 32 ATPs from just one molecule of glucose. With ATP, you're just going to break off each of those phosphate groups and release energy that way. And here you see the relative exergonicity, or the Gibbs free energy release, of certain compounds. So phosphoenolpyruvate can release 62 kilojoules of energy per mole, ATP can release 31 kilojoules, and AMP can release 14 kilojoules. So you can see here that as you go through the glycolytic pathway in the TCA cycle, you're actually losing some energy along the way. You're becoming less efficient, and you're generating compounds that are less and less exergonic. So glucose can release more energy than PEP, and PEP can release more energy than plain old pyruvate, and then ATP is what you're ultimately trying to generate. So be aware of the relative exergonicity of these molecules. That's pretty much all you need to know about Gibbs free energy. Since we have a little extra time, I want to review some of the important rate-limiting enzymes that we've already come across, and a few that we haven't gotten to quite yet. Now remember, rate limiters are very important to know for step one. And actually, let's do this as a whiteboard review. So over here on the right, I've listed several important rate-limiting enzymes, and we're going to match them to the biochemical processes on the left. The rate-limiting enzyme in de novo pyrimidine synthesis was carbamyl phosphate synthetase 2. Not CPS1, it's CPS2 for pyrimidine synthesis. And for de novo purine synthesis, it was glutamine PRP amidotransferase. The rate limiter for glycolysis is phosphofructokinase 1, PFK1. For gluconeogenesis, it's fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. For glycogen synthesis, which we'll cover in the next video, the rate limiting enzyme is glycogen synthase, which is pretty easy to remember. And then for glycogenolysis, where you're breaking down glycogen to release glucose into the bloodstream, the rate-limiting enzyme is called glycogen phosphorylase. Then after glycogen, we're going to talk about the TCA cycle, and the rate limiter in the TCA cycle is isocitrate dehydrogenase. And then for the hexose monophosphate shunt, the rate limiter is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD. So that's a little preview of coming attractions for the next few videos.
And for your prize, here's a groovy little psychedelic smiley face. Far out. All right, let's go ahead and do the end of session quiz. First question, what irreversible enzymes are involved in gluconeogenesis? So you have pyruvate carboxylase, PEP carboxykinase, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, which is the rate limiter, and glucose 6-phosphatase. So make sure you know those enzymes. Next, what enzyme catalyzes the rate limiting step in gluconeogenesis? That's fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. And the last question, order the following molecules by how much energy they contain that can be made available to fuel endergonic reactions. So from the highest energy to the lowest energy, it's glucose, then pyruvate, ATP, AMP, and then adenosine. All right, that's it for Biochem 8. I'll see you next time. Hey, man. How's it hanging? Studying hard? Groovy. Ready for a little study partner quiz action? Here goes. What's the formula for Gibbs free energy? Right on, man. Delta G equals delta H minus T times delta S. Far out. Free energy, man. It sounds so groovy, but it's not just like positive vibes and stuff. It's the amount of energy released by an exergonic reaction. But who's this Gibbs guy anyway? Energy doesn't belong to anybody, man. It's free. It belongs to, like, the cosmos, far out. Whoa, dude, is that a double rainbow?